Hey, good morning again. Thank you for joining us. If you're new, my name is Mark Lohman, the lead pastor here at The Bridge. And I just want you to know we miss everyone so much. We absolutely cannot wait to see you physically in person in our worship center. Um, And the good news is we are getting far, far, far closer to that happening. And so because of that, Um, This morning is actually a really, really important message for the bridge. It just so happens, um, or maybe I should say it hasn't happened by chance, that God has lined up where we are in the book of Ephesians as we march through this letter um, with the specific passage that we are in this morning, along with this moment that we're looking at as we become very close um, to regathering as a church, looking at when and how and what will it look like for us to physically regather in our worship center on a Sunday morning. Real quick, as a summary, um, if you've been with us going through this series, uh, I said in the beginning that you can summarize the book of Ephesians with the tagline of becoming who you already are. And you can split this letter right in half. The first three chapters, chapters one through three, are written in what's called the indicative mood, meaning they are full of facts. And this morning, we get to the halfway point. Chapter four, verse one, Paul begins the second half. And so what he's done is the first three chapters Here is who you are in Jesus. You are holy, you are chosen, you are blessed, redeemed, reconciled. And now he's going to say, chapter 4, verse 1, he's going to switch and he's going to say, in light of who you already are in Jesus, live this out. Become who you already are. This is your identity because of what Jesus has done for you. And now here is what he says. Paul's tone changes and he goes from writing about facts to telling us how to apply these truths. And that is where we find ourselves this morning. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1, Paul writes this. As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you... To live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Because you're holy, because you're redeemed, because you're forgiven, live now as if that's already true of you. Start living in line with your identity. Become who you already are in Jesus. See, our doing flows from our being. What you do comes from who you are in Jesus. And to be clear, absolutely, this is a process. It doesn't happen overnight, but Paul is urging us to take a step further in our journey this morning. Now, here's the fascinating thing about this part, this important turn in the halfway point in Ephesians. I I don't know about you, but um, I would expect Paul in this moment to like turn to um, what we would think of as the most important pressing matters of life. For instance, I think Paul, I would expect him to write something like, hey, you know, as a prisoner for the Lord, then um, I want to urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you received. So stop practicing sexual immorality. Or or maybe I would expect Paul to say, hey, therefore, as the prisoner of the Lord, um, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling you've received, so stop being greedy. Or or, or what about, hey, you know, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, uh, so stop partying and living foolishly. Is that what Paul says, though? It's not. What is the first thing on Paul's mind as he turns to the second half and gets to the, here's how you live this out part? Verse 2, 
I'm going to read for us verses 2 through verse 6, which is the remaining part of our passage. Paul writes, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you are called to one hope when you are called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Really, Paul? Unity? This is the first topic that you turn to, Paul, after three, like, epic chapters. I mean, isn't unity one of those topics that, like, you know, everyone likes to talk about and it makes for great advertisements, but we all know, hey, you know, it's not really practical and, hmm, is it really worth it? Is it really needed? Some of us may think unity is overrated. It just makes life harder. We don't need that. As we begin to soon physically regather on Sundays, I cannot think of a more prevalent and pressing topic for us as a community of Jesus followers than unity. See, I think there are, there are obviously a ton of, of tragic implications to COVID-19. And I think one of them that we're starting to see now is that disunity has started in our country. Like the whole discussion of reopening the world, the economy, churches, so on, how to do that, when to do that, has become a politically dividing issue. I mean, like literally, whether you wear a mask or not has become like a statement of party lines. And you know what Satan wants the most in this? To use this issue to divide the church. Now, I want to be clear. (laughs) I'm not talking politics this morning. But what I do want us to help, um, I want to help us listen to Paul about how we should navigate this dividing response as to when and how to reopen in light of COVID-19. Verse 3 is key to this discussion. Paul writes, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through The bond of peace. See, Paul's point here is that Jesus' sacrificial death has brought peace to these two highly different and conflicting groups. Those two groups being Jews and Gentiles. I mean, they were radically different and completely hostile towards one another. And we went over this back in the second half of Ephesians chapter 2. And and we saw that the cross is our peace. Not just between us and God, but between us and each other. See, the cross isn't just vertical, it's also horizontal. You know, it's interesting, the word that Paul uses here for bond is related to the term at the beginning of this passage that describes his imprisonment. Just as Paul is bound to his guard in prison by chains, Paul wants followers of Jesus in the Ephesus region and now 2,000 years later today for us to be bound in peace and love. Jesus is the chain that unites us together. This is why Paul says in verses 4 through 6, if you didn't catch it, he says, there's one body, there's one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who's over all and through all and in all. I mean, like, Obviously, do you catch 
all the ones that Paul has in there. Paul's not playing Uno. Here is Paul's point. The gospel, the good news of Jesus has made you one. That's why he says there's one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And here's the point. You're one, so become who you already are. You are one, so live that way. Listen to this quote by Joni Erickson Tata. She writes this. Believers are never told to become one. We already are one and are expected to act like it. Let me say it again. Believers are never told to become one. We are already one and are expected to act like it. Now, did you catch what Paul says there in verse 3? Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. See, we are called to keep unity, not create unity. See, the gospel creates unity, not us. But we are to make every effort to keep it. So let me ask you this. Is unity an option? Like, oh, you know, maybe if you just feel like being united. No. It's a commandment. See, unity is a requirement, not an option. And it's a commandment because it's a natural result of the gospel. The good news of Jesus creates one family. Now, when we talk about unity... Let me give a couple really clear, important disclaimers. First, do not confuse unity for uniformity. Don't confuse unity for uniformity. And praise God for that. Let me ask you this. Did the early church look the same? Absolutely not. See, some were Gentiles, some were Jews, some were educated like the Apostle Paul, others were fishermen like Peter. Some were wealthy, most were poor. Some were evangelists, others were administrators. Right? I think in today's world, some of the church are Democrats, some are Republicans, some of us use an iPhone, some of us use an Android. (laughs) So with the diversity of the early church, do you think there was disagreement? Absolutely. The early church was full of conflict. Isn't that a fascinating thing to think about? The early church was full of conflict. I actually find that to be somewhat comforting. See, unity doesn't mean that we all agree on the same thing. Now, of course, to be clear, there are really important theological truths that are not up for grabs, right? I mean, the gospel, the good news of Jesus is the very thing that that grounds and provides our unity, and that's not up for disagreement, right? And and that includes a bunch of um, orthodox important Christian beliefs that have been held for 2,000 years. And I think that's maybe what Paul gets at when he says, there's one God, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one hope, so on. There are non-negotiables. And those are the very things that in light of our differences, bring us together. See, theology or our beliefs about Jesus provides us our unity But often it's our behavior that fractures our unity. Theology provides our unity, but it's usually behavior that fractures our unity. Now, there are always exceptions, but it seems to me it's usually personal preferences and traditions and attitudes and behavior that destroys our unity not what we usually believe about Jesus. So here's what I want to do this morning. I want to look at the two sides 
of COVID-19. Now, I'm going to overgeneralize here a little bit, but hopefully you see what I'm doing. Let me talk about the two sides of this whole conversation of reopening in COVID-19. On one side, there are those who believe that, hey, we should go back to normal. Everything's fine. There's no need to shelter at home. You don't need to wear a mask outside. Um, you know, usually this camp is also going to say, hey, the government cannot take away our constitutional rights. And, and usually this camp's like, hey, the church, the church should have been open like two weeks ago. Like, what, what, you're actually already behind the line. Right? Maybe some in this camp think that there's like a conspiracy theory behind COVID-19 um, or they argue for something called herd immunity um, or they look at the stats of it and say, hey, it's actually, you know, maybe not that different than the regular flu or in terms of the death rate, so on. And by the way, I'm not judging either side of these. I'm just saying here's one end of the spectrum. Now, on the other end is this camp. And this camp says, no, 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 no. We are not ready to go back to normal. Like, no, you need to stay in your house. We should be sheltering at home still. You need to wear a mask everywhere. Temperatures need to be taken. Um, you know, businesses, churches, they shouldn't be opening yet because that may increase the spread of this contagious virus. The important thing right now for this group is the health and safety and prevention of COVID-19. Again, those are really big generalizations I just gave. Please forgive me. I'm not a scientist um, or a sociologist. All I'm saying is that I think in most ways you can say, you have two sides right now that are saying, this side saying, hey, let's go back to normal. This side saying, no, we aren't ready to. And I can tell you, as a pastor at the bridge, in our congregation, we have both camps. I personally have talked to people in our church, a part of the bridge, that believe this side, and then others that believe this side. I personally know people who have not been affected by COVID-19 at all, meaning they don't know someone who's gotten the virus um, and they have not been economically affected. And then I also know people who actually have gotten COVID-19 or have been laid off and dramatically affected economically by this. Here's my first question for you this morning. Who do you typically unify with? What ultimately unifies you with other people? See, for most of us, we naturally um, find unity with people who think just like us, people who are on our side. And let me just say, and if that's how we find our unity, the church will crumble. Let me ask you, Will you go to Jesus to find unity or will you turn to what side you're on in this whole dialogue of reopening in the midst of COVID-19? See, if we find unity by finding and going with those who are part of our own camp, let me just tell you, we will be divided. There will be division. And guess what? Others will notice. If we go to Jesus and look to him for our commonality, we will be united in light of our differences. And let me tell you this, people will notice. Now, Mark, that's a pipe dream. <laughs> I mean, you're telling me to be united with people that I flat out disagree with? Who see, who see things differently than I do? I mean, what, what does that even look like in practice? So glad you asked. Paul tells us in verse 2 how to do this. Here's the secret. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. You know, it's interesting. 
In the ancient first century world, humility was a vice, not a virtue. Humility was not celebrated. And, and this is actually one reason of many that makes Jesus so countercultural and revolutionary. See, Jesus perfectly fulfilled and demonstrates for us the ultimate example of humility, of gentleness, of patience, of bearing with one another in love. Every single one of us has been shown a lot of patience by God. The word patience here in Greek literally means long suffering. There are some of us that God has suffered a long time with, right? If we're honest, we are all just a bunch of screw ups who God continually loves and forgives and pursues. I mean, he literally bore our burdens on the cross. And so we may think, oh, you know, it's only the pushovers who are humble and gentle and patient. Oh, that's a sign of weakness. No, 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 no. See, in God's kingdom, those are signs of strength and unity. And the king himself embodies them. So here's the second question for you today. And it's straight from Paul himself. I want you to ask yourself right now, are you completely humble and gentle, patient, bearing with one another in love? Do other people see that in you? Would they, would they describe you as humble, gentle, patient, and loving? Is that how you're going to act with someone who has an entirely different view than you especially as it regards to reopening amongst COVID-19. Brett McCacken has written a fabulous article titled, Church, Don't Let Coronavirus Divide You. I'm going to read you um, a somewhat of a lengthy quote from this. It's so good, so practical for this moment. Listen to this. He writes, For example, Someone might find it personally difficult, even maddening, to have to wear a mask during church and stay six feet away from everyone at all times. You might think these precautions are a needless overreaction. But here's the thing. Even if it turns out that you're right, can you not sacrifice your ideal for a season? out of love for others who believe the precautions are necessary? See, even if you personally think it's silly or even cowardly for someone to stay home, even after the church is open again on Sundays, can you not heed Paul's wisdom in Romans 14? Let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. Or what about 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9? Be careful, however, that your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. Now, likewise, those who think the lockdowns should continue should not pass judgment on those who question the wisdom of the government's ongoing restrictions. Churches should strive to honor people on both sides of the spectrum. Yes, it will be costly for churches to keep offering online services for those who don't feel comfortable attending physical gatherings. Yes, it will be a sacrifice for church members who are sick of masks and social distancing and Zoom to continue to use these for the sake of others. But little is more Christian than a posture of sacrifice. We should embrace it with gladness. See, when you and I aren't full of humility 
or gentleness or patience. And instead, we're full of pride and rage and bitterness towards someone at the bridge. And we are disrupting unity. What you're really doing is being anti-gospel. You're saying the gospel, the good news of Jesus, isn't for this person. That person doesn't deserve to be shown humility, gentleness, patience, and love. That's what your actions are saying. And who are you, who am I to do that when those are the very traits that God in Jesus has shown me. Jesus has shown me, he's shown you complete humility and gentleness and patience and love. And he's included your burdens on the cross. Precisely because God has done this for you, he's radically pardoned you. He's paid a debt that you can never pay. He's given you grace that you never deserved. We should be the first in line to show others that. See, not only should we practice unity because we are already one in the gospel, but because according to Jesus, that's also how this world will know that we are his followers. John 13, 35, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Check this out. This is really cool, I think. See, the bridge's unity is actually a foretaste. It's an appetizer. It's a sign of what Jesus is going to eventually do to his whole creation. What do I mean? If, if, if you remember our very first Sunday in this series, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul writes, he says, hey, when the times reach their fulfillment, and here it is, to bring unity to all things in heaven and earth under Christ. See, Jesus' grand plan is to unite heaven and earth together. And the church, the bridge, is to actually anticipate and offer a sign and a symbol of that now with our unity. And honestly... I think the American church has has not done a good job at this. This is a really weighty invitation and opportunity for us. So let me leave you with this. For the bridge, for you individually, the question is, are you walking worthy of the calling that you've already received? What's the calling? Verse 2. Are you humble, gentle, patient, and bearing with one another in love? Are you keeping unity at the bridge and beyond? Are you letting your actions of love towards those that you disagree with, who aren't like you, are you allowing that to be a signpost of God's love? to reconcile this whole world. That, brothers and sisters, is the invitation for you, for me, for us. Today, this week, the next couple months, and the rest of our lives.